You know, Jesus is so wonderful. I don't know if everybody's had a glimpse of Jesus here today or those listening at home. But you know, he's so wonderful and one meeting with Jesus changes everything forever. It's beyond words. You know, what preachers, we try to communicate. You witness to someone, you try to communicate about Jesus. It's so difficult. You know, someone who's lived in a desert all their life, they sleep in a dark cave, and they go out and it's just dry, dusty, barren. And you're talking to them about paradise, about trees and birds and the ocean, and swimming pools and, and TVs and wonderful things. And, and it's so difficult to communicate, isn't it? Because they're like, what are you talking about? They, just know, they don't exist. All we see is sand and dryness and the cave and dry, horrible, moldy old bread. And this, that's it. That's life. And you say, no, man, there's something else. There's, there's, there's the ocean you can swim in. It's beautiful. It's cool and wonderful. You can have all these delicious drinks. You know, you can live in paradise. You can see the sky and it's so amazing and the clouds and... and until they experience him, it's very difficult. But we preach the word, and God's word doesn't return void. It accomplishes that which we set out to do, either for salvation or for judgment. So they have an invitation. And I just want to, I just wanted to, uh, during the worship, I just really felt, you know, and I was thinking about it last night and this morning, how wonderful Jesus is to us. It's, he's just so incredible. You know, we talk about him as though he is like a book of instructions or law or <clears throat> some kind of inanimate object. But he's such so personable. He smiles. He sings over you. He thinks about you. He dances. He, he rejoices. He likes delicious food and drink. You know, he's a wonderful kind. He's a safe person. Do you know what that means? He is completely safe. He will never abuse you. He will never misuse you. He will never be irritable with you. He will be firm and kind and generous and merciful, sometimes stern, you know, like a good person. There is nobody that good in this world. Everyone in this world will let you down to some degree at some point. But Jesus will never let you down. He is the treasure that we look for. So Lord Jesus, I just pray this morning that you would give me the words, Lord, to speak to your people. And that everyone listening today would be blessed. That you would speak a word to them. And in Jesus' name, I just want to rebuke you, Satan, and you demons off every listener today. Off me now and off every listener. You will not steal these words. You will not try to delay the promises of God, to abort the plans of God in anyone's life. You come as a thief to steal. But I say, thief, give back what you've stolen now to every person. I rebuke you off every listening ear this morning, today. I command you not to steal these words and to give back to the people the hope and the prosperity that God has promised for us. The victory in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. The promises of God. What are the promises of God, Deborah? What did you say this week? The promises of God are? Yea and, our, yay and amen. So, if you have a problem in your life, it's not from God. We have an enemy who steals, who kills, who destroys. Every problem in our, li in our lives is not. The source of it is not God. Curses are a problem. A curse is a problem. It can kill you. It can just make you have a little bit of a bad day. A whole range of problems. The enemy is one who curses. But God is one who blesses us. And we've been talking recently about how God wants to prosper us as people. And we've been talking about, in particular, how we fail to come into that prospering. And how we don't access the joy and the peace and the victory that God has died to give us. I want to talk today briefly about a passage from Malachi. Um, really, this needs more time and I will revisit it. Malachi 3 verses 5 to 12. 
If you want to find that in your Bibles... I've got a spare Bible here if you want a Bible. So when you go home today, guys, look at this passage and read it again. And think about what I'm saying. We have to participate in the things of God and not be passive and just expect the word of God to just float down upon us and the blessings of God to just happen. We participate in it. We partner with God to make these things happen, to bring them about. God gives them to us. We have to receive them. God gives it to you. You have to receive it. Yeah? If I give you a winning ticket, you put it in your pocket and you rejoice for a day because you've won. Whatever it is, a car, lots of money, whatever it is, a holiday. You've won, you've got the winning ticket. But if you don't do anything with that ticket, it will just stay in your pocket and you won't access that which has been given to you. And this is the story of forgiveness of sin, of healing, of blessings financially, of many different things that God has promised us. We have the winning ticket. It was given to us on the cross. But we've got to use it. We've got to take it and cash it in. And then go on the holiday. And then go and do whatever God wants us to do. Enjoy peace and forgiveness. Enjoy our healing. We've all tasted illness. It's not nice, is it? But God wants us to taste healing and physical prosperity. Malachi 3.5 At that time, I will put you on trial. I am eager to witness against all sorcerers, adulterers and liars. Now it's interesting because I had um, a conversation this week with somebody about sorcery and we were talking about it and one of the things I felt the Lord impress upon me 20 years ago was that smoking of cannabis is sorcery sorcery is witchcraft so witchcraft operates in different ways enchantments which is the spoken word spells casting of spells curses enchantment it operates in in all kinds of different ways one of the things is sorcery, and sorcery involves an object. Now it's interesting, because I looked this up, I looked up the word sorcery last night, and guess where the, where, it, 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 it's based on a Greek word, let me just find that word, I don't know how to pronounce it, pharmakia, I think that's how you pronounce it, P-H-A-R-M-A-K-E-I-N. Pharmakia. Guess what other word we have in the English language that relates to this root word for sorcery? Pharmacy. Huh? It's about potions. In the older days, before we had the scientific medication, which I don't believe is wrong, we have scientific medication, it's based upon a real substance, a physical substance to combat a physical problem. They used to create potions to treat different illnesses, and also they would give you a potion, perhaps if you wanted to fall in, fall in love with a certain woman or man, they'd give you a potion, and you take that potion or they'd give you a substance, or they'd give you an object, or a piece of hair, or whatever it would be. You do something with that. That is sorcery. It's using sorcery. It's quite interesting. Recreational drugs is sorcery. It's witchcraft. It's utter rebellion against God. And it's ultimately seeking to control. It's seeking to control an experience. It's seeking to control your body, seeking to control something else. There is no such thing as innocent drug use. When I say drug use, I'm not talking about paracetamol. I'm talking about cannabis. I'm talking about LSD. I'm talking about magic mushrooms. Magic mushrooms, you know, is, is pure witchcraft. Some people take these things, professional, we're not talking about crazy people on the street in Piccadilly, we're talking about people, professional people, take a little bit of um, LSD, of acid, of magic mushrooms, because it just does something to them and it calms them down, because they struggle with all kinds of issues and problems. 
And they say it's a benefit, it's a helpful thing. And there's huge research going on in these areas. Magic mushrooms are pure witchcraft. Smoking a tiny bit of, of cannabis, you have, you have participated in witchcraft and you will be immediately full of demons. You will need deliverance. I'm talking about one puff of a spliff. I'm talking about one little drag. You will immediately have demons because you've done something that is utterly an utter rebellion against God. You practice sorcery and witchcraft. This is why it's so important. And we were talking about this this week. And it's just by chance I came across this last night. And I thought, wow, I'm preaching on this word. And I just, it's, it, it just confirmed to me something. It's so incredible. But you know what the world will say? The odd spliff's okay. It's better than getting drunk. It's better than getting angry and beating my wife up. It's better than doing this. It's better. Than... No, it's not. It's, it's taking control away from God and not trusting in Him with all your heart. Now listen, smoking tobacco is also a substance. I never thought about this before, this is hot off the press, okay? Smoking tobacco, what is, what is the sin of smoking tobacco? I've never thought this. I've always thought smoking tobacco is, if it's a sin, it's the least of sins. I've not had a cigarette for 20 years. I've not had a cigarette for 20 years. I still miss cigarettes. I mean, tobacco. Oh my goodness, I love the smell of it. I love the packets. I love the look of a cigarette. Everything, everything about it. But the sin of smoking to cigarettes is the sin of sorcery. Because you're using a substance, a potion. It's not pleasing to the Lord. No one's smoking in church today. We don't do that. It's not right. Excess alcohol. I don't believe there's anything wrong in having a drink. You see, there is a difference between a bit of alcohol and cannabis. And don't listen to what the world says, is that the two are, are uh, equatable. In fact, alcohol is more dangerous. Yeah, if you're going to be an alcoholic, if you're susceptible to alcoholism, it's very dangerous and you are using it as sorcery in that case. But if you're having a, um, a, a, a normal amount of alcohol, you are still completely in control of your body. I think that's different. We also would say, eating the wrong foods all the time. Again, there's nothing wrong in eating any kind of food. Cream cakes, nothing wrong with cream cakes. There's nothing wrong in a nice, wonderful takeaway. But if you have that every day, and you are ex ex having it excessively, I believe that this becomes a form of sorcery. And what is the great sorcery in terms of food that we are under attack from? Carbohydrates. Never before, well, possibly the, in, in odd occasions in civilizations in the past, but never before, perhaps for the last 150 years, we have been assailed by carbohydrate. Excessive carbohydrate. Diets saturated in carbohydrates. And this is why we have an explosion <clears throat> of diabetes, of heart problems, of obesity, of strokes, of dementia, of all kinds of things that come along with it. Laziness, lazy minds. You just get tired. You come under this... You know, if you have too many carbohydrates, you can just get into a carbohydrate slumber. There's nothing wrong. In the Bible, we have times where the Lord even said, eat sweet things. Eat the fat. Eat the sweet. Celebrate. It's a party. It's a feast. We can do that. That's not sorcery. But if you have a lifestyle of the indulgence in the wrong kinds of food, greasy, nasty, fatty foods, sugar carbohydrate, drenching your diet with carbohydrate. I believe that's a form of, of sorcery. Now you may, you may disagree with me about that, but it's an interesting one to debate and I think, I think there's something significant about this. The priests in Israel had a diet almost exclusively of red meat and they thrived and they did well. I don't believe we were ever intended 
to have huge amounts of grains, of cereals, of processed carbohydrates, of breads, of sugars. I don't believe that we, it's God's will for us to eat that food. Okay, let me carry on. We use it as a drug, Jackie. We use it, it's not a crutch, it's a drug. Carbohydrate is addictive. Let me tell you, cannabis is massively addictive. And it's, all the research suggests it's not. But if you know people who smoke cannabis, they can't stop. They say, well, it's not physically addictive, it's like emotionally. Or, no, it's spiritually addictive. If, you, if you're with somebody who smokes a lot of cannabis, and you're with them for a few hours, they begin to fall apart until they have another, another dose of cannabis. They can't cope. They become a monster around you. They have to have some more. I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages, who oppress widows and orphans, or who de deprive the foreigners living among you of justice. For these people do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The things of God only work when we do them his way. This is what the Lord, I say, say, but he hit me between the eyes with this over 20 years ago. The things of God only work when we do them his way. Now, if you take a Christian today, someone who has at some time made a commitment to Christ, and things are not working out in their life as they want them to, sooner or later they will say things like, oh, I'm, thinking of, I'm, thinking of, I'm getting angry with the Lord, I tell you I'm getting angry. This isn't right. I'm not happy with this. I pray these prayers. I listen to those words. And, I'm, and they go in on, and they start complaining and they start getting down or depressed or discouraged. Things aren't working. You ask them. You go through their life. And this is what the Lord has done with me. And whenever I struggle, I do this to myself again. Am I doing things God's way? Because it's not going to work if I'm not doing it God's way. If I want to mix witchcraft in my life, if I want to mix sin, if I want to mix rebellion, if I want to be lazy and apathetic to the things of God, because I'm not, I, I tell you, I tell you I'm a pretty strong Christian. I'm not as strong as I should be, and I'm not as strong as other people always, but I'm a pretty strong Christian. I'm pretty consistent. My wife's sitting here today. Am I consistent, a pretty consistent Christian? I'm not saying I'm perfect, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm a pretty strong Christian. In this country, I'm up there in the, in the top 5 or 10%, because this country is not very good. If you put me in Africa, then I've dropped down percentage-wise. Put me in the Chinese underground church, and probably in the bottom 10%. But I'm still pretty strong, still a pretty strong Christian. I cannot stand as a Christian unless I'm doing things God's way. I will fall apart. If I'm not spending time with him, if I'm not praying, if I'm not seeking after him, if I'm not examining my heart and my life and my lifestyle before the word of God, measuring not by how I feel, not by what other people say, not by the preachers, not by anyone else. If I measure myself and my life by the word of God and then correct my life to come in line with the word of God, then I prosper and I do well. But if I'm not doing those things, I begin, to, I begin to erode and fall apart. As a Christian, I start to go down. I'm not as strong, I'm not happy, I'm not in communion with God. Things are not working as they should. And I'm a pretty strong Christian. It's taken me a long time to become to this where I am today. But I can't stand as a Christian unless I do things God's way. So we need to examine our lives and our heart according to the scriptures. And then correct our lifestyle to come in line with the word of God. And then the things of God will work in my life. What's in the Bible is very different to what necessarily is in our minds in our beliefs, in our traditions, in our families, in our church. And it's certainly different to how I feel. So I may feel it's okay to do this. I may feel it's okay not to pay that money when I should pay it. 
because that's how I do things and that's how we do things in our lives but that's not <laughs> according to the Word of God if I've done something wrong to somebody and I just brush it aside I may think that's acceptable because in my family that's what you do or in my my social group that's what everyone does that no it's not acceptable to the Lord I need to go and apologize for that I need to go and put things right verse 6 I am the Lord and I do not change are you listening guys I am the Lord and I do not change we change society changes culture changes those around us who aren't Christians will have a major influence on us if we take counsel from them but the Lord says I do not change that is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed praise God ever since the days of your ancestors you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them now return to me and I will return to you says the Lord of heaven's armies return to me repentance what does repentance mean repentance means in a nutshell stop doing it stop doing it confession is saying to God I've done it repentance is making a decision to stop doing it so again these are the things of God if you simply say Lord you know I know that wasn't right last night I know it wasn't right what I did today I know what isn't wasn't right what I did a week ago I'm sorry that's good that's in line with the Word of God now you need to repent now you need to make a lifestyle choice and decision to stop doing it now if you fail you confess God forgives you but if your heart is set on turning away from that sin and that lifestyle that's called repentance and God will honor that and the things of God work in your life if you don't want to do that if you want to be a Christian who continues in sin but keeps coming to the Lord and confessing their sin sooner or later that's not going to work anymore in your life God's not going to bless that because the devil's watching and he's a thief and you're allowing him into your life to steal from you and to bring destruction so you need to do things God's way I knew this man he was an alcoholic he became a Christian stopped drinking praise God he confessed his sin of an alcoholic alcohol alcoholism and God forgave him he came, for, he came to have some discipleship training every week he turned up he said I did really well five days <clears throat> and then the sixth day I had a, had a drink I drank myself silly blacked out <clears throat> woke up the next day and, I said, I'm, I'm, and, and the person said well, don't worry you know you slipped up confess your sin to God and he did do and he was forgiven and he had peace but week after week this kept on happening he'd have five days maybe 14 days what dry and then he'd drink and get drunk so eventually the counselor said to him tell me what's happening in your life and he said well I'm doing really good but when I go and see my friends in the pub I only have orange juice and everything's fine but you know what happens by the end of the night I end up having a little whiskey just one or brandy and then I wake up the next morning covered in vomit and I don't know people aren't talking to me and it's the life's crazy so the counselor said well you've got to change your lifestyle because when you go to the pub meeting your old friends who are all drinkers sooner or later in that evening you're gonna fall into sin so what the decision you need to make is to change your lifestyle you need to stop going to the pub but my friends are all there now you have a choice to make you need new friends you need to get involved with a, fe a Christian fellowship a church you need to leave those friends behind it's gonna cost you something to follow Christ you need to deny yourself the social I know I know another alcoholic who's a minister he hasn't been in a pub or drunk for decades actually he's with the Lord now but he said he always still missed the pub because he said he preferred the pub to church because he preferred the atmosphere in a pub the convivial social friendly chit chat laughing having a good time he missed that he always missed that 
He never got over that. But he stopped drinking and he didn't go to the pub anymore. And he became a, an amazing Christian leader. And that's an example that sometimes it's going to cost us. Maybe you have to move house. Maybe you have to stand up to somebody in your life and say no. Maybe you have to throw your phone away. I don't know what, it's, I don't know what it involves, but it's going to cost you something. Ask God to show you your sin. Measure your life by the word of God. Not by how you feel, not by your learning and understanding, not by the counsel of those around you. Not by your traditions, and not by how you feel, or what you think. Deny all of that, and come to the word of God, study the word of God, and measure yourself by the word of God. My inner attitudes need to, sh need to shift, which involves being humbled. I need to humble myself. Many of us have made idols of our opinions, idols of our beliefs. But when we actually s get down to the Word of God and measure our beliefs and our traditions by the Word of God, those things have to change. Our culture. Our culture. Oh my goodness. Let's not get involved with that one. Our culture is now the Word of God. It's following Christ. We are a new people. We are in Christ. How do we identify? Do I identify as white British man? I mean, I don't know whether you can say man nowadays. Whatever it is, you know. Because according to the wisdom of the world, you know, men can have babies. And all kinds of things. So the whole thing's got mixed up. How do I measure myself? My identity is in Christ. It's into the Word of God. It doesn't matter what the educational system or the government tells us or our ethnic group or whatever it would be. You know, Adolf Hitler loved all of that talk. And look, where, look what happened to him and look what he did. Our identity is that we died, we got baptized, which symbolizes our death and we wrote, came out of the water we confessed our sin to God we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior now we are brothers and sisters in Christ that's our identity that's who we are it's, really big, it's a really big thing this because if you deny that and want to claim to be part of a different group then that's going to I don't think that is pleasing to the Lord and it's going to lead you into conflict at some point but our identity is in Christ Verse 7 still. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? And now God starts to talk about money at this point. Somebody once said that commitment to Christ, commitment is spelt M-O-N-E-Y. And as a pastor, I see... Before I was a pastor, I was a trustee of another church, and I was involved in money. And it's very interesting that you can see people's commitment so often through what they do with their money. Not always. Some of the worst people in the world tithe regularly and give, give lots of money. But <clears throat> generally, as a rule, you can see people's commitment according to their relationship with money and what they do with their money. And God says, return to me and I will return to you. Now it's arguable that God is actually talking here about money. Because he goes on to say, they, get, they say, how can we return to you? We're here already. And God says, should you cheat me? Should you cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? God said, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. And because of that you are under a curse. For your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. 
Your grapes will not fall from the vines before they are ripe, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Guys, I'm preaching and you're having a dialogue all the time. What's, what are you doing? Huh? But you've got to listen to what I'm saying. Okay? You're not going to hear this in school. You're not going to hear this on TV. Okay? It's really important. Okay. No worries. So the Lord said, return to me and I will return to you. Now, what does this mean? God, I think, I've always thought this is about our sinful nature returning to the Lord. And God will return, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. But I think that there's also, it can be argued, that God is actually talking specifically about money in this case. What happens when we tithe? Are we giving money to God? We're going to have an offering in a minute. Are we going to call it a collection? We're collecting pennies for the Lord? Like he's some kind of fool who sits on the street asking for money? Are we collecting pennies for a collection? Let's have a collection for God. Because we know God's poor. Because if you never need anything, you wouldn't go to the Lord. And you certainly wouldn't go to church. That's not what we're doing with, with, with our offerings. We, we're, we're giving a tithe. So we are just returning to the Lord a portion of that which he has first given to us. We're not giving anything to God. <laughs> David prayed in Chronicles. Everything we have comes from you. And of your own do we give to you. So we need to know that our tithe is something we do in faith. Because it's right, but we do it in a, with a worshipful heart and a heart of thanksgiving. We give our money back to the Lord that he has first given to us. And the understanding and the knowledge that everything we have first came from him. He's given us a hundred pounds. We don't choose to give him five pounds because we're poor this week. Or ten pounds because we're thinking really good about ourselves. There you go, God. There's a tenner. No, it's, we need to be reverent, we need to be respectful, we need to be joyful, because we know that God has said to us, look, let's do a deal. I'll look after you, and I require you to participate in this. So you return to me a 10%. You return to me a tithe. I'm not asking you for 90%. I'm giving you, I'm going to bless you with all that you need. I'm going to pour blessings out upon you. More blessings than you actually can, can carry. <clears throat> when we give our tithes, it is, I think we need to have a change of attitude. It's part of our worship. And we joyfully give in faith, knowing that as we give, God will provide for us. It goes on to talk about bringing all our tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If we don't do this, we come under a curse. What's a curse? A curse is a problem. The curse is not necessarily God inflicting with some, us with something, but we're opening a doorway for the enemy to take from us, to steal from us. Now we're coming into a season of the world what are we talking about? Energy prices rising. We're going around the house turning lights off. We're thinking about our heating. We're thinking about what kind of company is going to provide our gas and electric. We're getting fearful, according to the news, about what's coming to us this winter. That possibly gas and electric prices will escalate to something crazy. It's even Christians on the internet are saying, stop paying your bills. It's not right. It's not fair. Stop paying. Don't pay. Don't pay. Which I don't agree with. But we as Christians rest secure in the knowledge that God is going to provide all that we need. Now when I talk about this, 
When I've talked about this in the past, people have come up to me and afterwards, and afterwards and pointed out examples of people in the world who don't have all that they need. And they say, you can't preach this because somebody in Africa, whatever, doesn't have enough food to eat. So how can you preach this? Because it doesn't work for them. Well, I don't know what they're doing in their life, but I know that the word of God is true. I do believe it will work. Certain circumstances, there are many reasons why the, why the things of God don't work in somebody's life. But I do believe even in situations of famine, even in hard places, the Lord will provide all that we need according to the word of God. So ultimately, we need to think, am I going to, am I going to trust in my own understanding? Am I going to trust in what other people are saying around me? Am I going to trust in the counsel of people? Or am I going to trust in the word of God? And when we do things God's way, I believe the word of God is going to work in our life. And I'm choosing to trust in that. So we don't have to fret and worry about our provision for this winter. For food, for our mortgages, our rents, our heating, and all that we need. We don't have to worry. God is going to provide for us and look after us. What do we do? As an act of faith, we bring our tithes into the storehouse. So this is what I would say. We bring our tithes into church. I know you pay online or you pay, pay in church. We do that. You bring it to your church. So if you have a person in need in your life or a situation that is really tugging on your heart and you think, well, I'll give some of my tithe to them, you are dishonoring the Lord at that point. And the things of God are not necessarily going to work for you as you want, even though you're giving 30% of your income away. But you're not bringing 10% into the church. It's not going to work as you want it to work. It's not just financial blessings that you will get. I believe we're talking about the blessings of God. The promises of God. The blessings of God will come into our life as we tithe respectfully in the fear of the Lord. Joyfully and by faith. You bring 10% to your local, to the church you're part of. If your church is undeserving of that money... If your church is a church that misuses that money, that's not preaching the gospel, why are you there? Why are you there? Because it's a tradition, because your family will be upset if you leave, because you've always been a Catholic, a Protestant, a Baptist, a Methodist, and, and it's just, you can't leave. You're just following the culture and the traditions of men. You're not, you're not following what the word of God says. If your church is undeserving of your tithe, leave it. Find another church. Pray about it. Seek the Lord. See what God says. If he says to stay, give your tithe to them. But if most people were to seriously fast and pray and seek the Lord about their church because they're disquiet in their spirit, maybe the Lord says it's time to leave. I'll find you a new church where you can invest in. We do things God's way and it works. I have so many Christians complain to me about their church. And I don't want to say to them, why are you there? They go on and on and on about the vicar, about the leader, about how things are not being done properly, about everything else. And there's nothing I can say to them. Because the question is, why are they there? And eventually, some of these people leave and never go back to another church again, which is often the case. Churches are emptying. If you're not in the right place, leave. If, you're not, if you don't feel comfortable in this church, you can leave. I'm not, I'll just bless you. If that's what you feel God is saying to you, I trust the word of God is in this church. I trust that we're in the right place. And I trust that we have a duty to speak to me. If you have a duty to speak to me, if something isn't right, to come and talk to me, to, we can work that through together. So, <clears throat> after you've tithed your 10%, if you then have other places to give to, give to them. If something is laid on your heart, sow into that ministry, sow into that person's life. That is an offering. But your tithe belongs to your local church. I think this is a really key. And then people can argue with me and they can say everything else. My reply to that would be, the things of God work when you do them his way. 
And if it's working for you, then God bless you. But you know, many times Christians are not entering into the prosperity and the blessings that God has provided for them. You can give your tithe to church with the wrong heart and not reap the benefits and the blessings that God wants to give you. If you're not doing it joyfully and thankfully, if you're not doing it in faith, knowing that as I do this, Lord, it's a joy to give this 10% because I know that you provide everything in my life. If you're not doing, if you're doing it begrudgingly, if you're doing it because it's like, oh my goodness, a 10%, that's like I get a thousand pounds, that's a hundred pounds, my bills are 940 pounds, that leaves me 40 pounds, 40 pounds short. Well, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Go on, I'll do it then, because that's what the Bible says. I'll give you the hundred pounds. If we're doing it with that kind of attitude, don't expect the blessings that are promised in the Word of God. Because the things of God only work when we do them His way. I have another Christian who argues with me about his taxes and his national insurance. So he says, I'm not tithing out of what I get in the top of my pay packet. I'm going to tithe out of, uh, after I've paid my tax, after all these other things have gone out, whatever's left, I'll give 10% of that. I think that's completely the wrong attitude. There's no, that we're not trusting in God that he is our provider. We give off the top. We give a portion to the Lord as he directs. We give a portion to the government as they, as they require. We pay our rent, we pay our food, we pay our bus pass, whatever it is. But off the top comes that tithe. How we do things matters. How we do things. It's not just coming to church and plonking yourself down on a chair and, and then going home thinking, well, I've been to church this week. Why are you coming? Why, why are we here? We, the way we come to church, how we come to church, what we do in church matters. I loved it this morning when Grace took a lead and was praying and leading us in prayer. And Deborah was at the front ministering to us in worship. Because they came with something to give, to participate in the, in the Holy Spirit who is here and working amongst us. Jackie going out, collecting people, bringing them to church. You know, it's good. How we, how, what we do in church matters. How we come to church matters. Whether we come to church matters. Christianity is not about church services. It's, it's not, but it's one of the things that we do. It's so important how we present ourselves in church. Let me see now. I think that's all I'm going to say this week. I know it's God's, as we've been talking in the previous sermons, it's God's intention for us to prosper, to be victorious. We will have problems and tribulations in this world. That doesn't mean that we're miserable, that we're downcast, that we're moaning and complaining and miserable. That's, doesn't, that's not the case. We will have tribulations. It's going to cost us to follow Christ. But the Lord has entitled us to be pros a prosperous people. To have all that we need, enough to share with others, of joy, of food, of hospitality, of words of encouragement, of finances. This is God's intention for us, to be a people unshaken by the storms of life. So as we do things God's way, we will enter into this prosperity and victory. I am convinced and I put my reputation on the line on the Word of God and on these matters. Prosperity preaching is a dirty word today, and I don't really understand what prosperity preaching is. I don't know if I'm doing it or not. I don't think I am. But I do know that it's God's intention for us to prosper, to be victorious in all the troubles and all the tribulations we face in this world. Amen. Did you have a question?